Okay, Mr. Watson here, and in this video we're going to look at economics and commercialism of the Olympic Games, all about that money. Okay, so here's just starting off with a quote. Long-term partnerships are the backbone of our commercial programs, and they enable the financial security of the entire Olympic movement. So let's take a look at that. what that means. They enable the financial security of the entire Olympic movement. So here's the positive effects of commercialism. It's helped saving the games for, from collapsing with all of these, this spiral of extravagance, costs rising year upon year. The extra funding is helping to still get cities to bid to host. Whether they are, they are lowering but it's still happening. It, we all it get funding from the media, funding from sponsorship. We're going to look at them numbers as we go through this presentation. The NOC now get financial support from the IOC due to this increase in media and sponsorship. So that will encourage cities to keep stay interested in hosting. The IOC can use some of this money to fund better against doping. Okay, and it also attracts the best athletes. If athletes know there's big numbers in this private sponsorship, they're going to want to be Olympians for longer. Okay, so now we're going to get into the numbers. Okay, what, what are the costs of hosting the Olympics and what do they receive in support from the IOC and what do they need to do themselves? So the, let's start with the IOC. So it, the IOC is privately funded ever since Athens 1896. The IOC's marketing program secures the finance of the Olympics, just like the quote we've just seen. We're going to look at what that marketing program is. Revenue is distributed to support NOCs, the international federations and the organizing committee. Revenue, 90% of it is distributed. And the sales of these global media rights mean that many can watch around the world, which is why it is the biggest viewed sporting competition. Okay. So let's look at the revenue sources. So where Olympic marketing revenue comes from. So if I can just bring your attention to the left side of the graphic, managed by the IOC, there's three main sources of revenue. We have the Olympic Partner Program, also known as the TOP or TOP Program. Okay, these are your main sponsors. It's like the highest level of sponsorship. Okay, so some at a local level, you see domestic sponsorship might pay for some things, etc. But the main sponsors get the best access rights to that. The IOC has broadcast partnerships. That's your TV selling the TV rights. Okay. And then we've got IOC official supplier and licensing program. So this will link to merchandise. Okay, they're their three main revenue sources. Okay, so you've got the top program. Okay, you've got broadcast partnerships and you've got a licensing and merchandise. Now, managed by the organizing committees um, under the direction of the IOC, the, the NOC and the, the organizing committees, they, they are in charge of the ticketing. Okay, if they can generate revenue through their own commercial programs, they can go and look for domestic sponsorship from that city. Okay, local businesses might want to get some of that. They, they can generate revenue. Here's the revenue sources from 2013 to 2016. And as you can see, broadcast rights, the TV provides the most revenue, 73% of it. And then we've got 18% of the top program marketing rights. Then we move down to licensing and merchandise. So TV rights are huge. They're bringing in the big money, okay? And the reason the IOC can demand the big money when, they, when they're selling it or they're you know, finding the highest bidder among these TV companies is because it's the biggest watch sports event in the world. So let's just take a look at how this money has increased over the years or 
um, from Olympics to Olympics, the past six Olympiads. Okay, so look at the broadcast there. You've gone from 1.2 bill to 4.1, okay, and then 279 million in sponsorship all the way up to a billion. So you've got spiral of extravagance here. If costs are going up, we're going to start charging the sponsors and broadcast more money. Okay, so we're looking at big money there, and you can see the increase is huge from 1993 to 2016. And then the organizing committee's revenue, what have they been able to generate themselves and gain quite a lot of money? Domestic sponsorship, a lot of money. Ticketing, 527 million there in the last Olympiad. And then licensing. So again, the, there's, there's a lot of money involved in the Olympics, okay? Revenue is coming in. However, we will look on in this presentation, does that cover the cost of hosting? Okay, but that's just an example there of the revenue coming in. Here's another clip. IOC awards Olympic Games broadcast rights to NBC through to 2032. NBC Universal being an American channel. Now let's look at the money. 7.65 billion that deal was. So it is an 11 year deal, but it's costing them 7.65 billion plus an additional 100 million signing bonus and that's going to be used to promote olympism them values them aims uh well when they pre-sign the deal that's what it's being used for up until tokyo okay so big money as you can see that's probably why it's 73 percent so here's the top program so right now we have 14 partners usually they've been around 9 10 11 12 um and this is one way you might want to pause so this video doesn't get too long about the what these official sponsors offer. But this is the highest level of Olympic partnership. Okay, it's not the only sponsors that happen, but this is the highest level. Okay, so as you can see, Coca-Cola, Airbnb, Panasonic, Samsung, your, your big your big shot companies. Okay, and as you can see, they have gone up. This is a recent graphic aiming for Tokyo. Uh, Sochi and Rio, they had 12 partners. It's now gone up to 14, okay? And as you can see there, the money spiraled up, okay? Going back to 85, 96, all the way up to a billion, okay? And let's take a look at lic licensing and merchandise. So there's 1,500 different products available being sold, okay? So this is from the Winter Olympics in Pyeongchang. Over 650,000 visitors to the two official superstores, okay? And they even made, in Korea, their own um, banknote, okay? And coins, people collecting it. So people are buying things related to the Olympics. You do have collectors. It just increases revenue sources, okay? Now let's look at the distribution. We mentioned that the IOC getting all this money, do distribute it. How do they do it? Well, 90% of it goes to the Olympic Games and promotion of the Olympic movement. 10% is kept for IOC activities and operations of the IOC. Okay, whatever that means. But 90% of it goes back into the Olympic Games. And we're always going to have this question. Is that 90% even enough? Because we're going to get into how much the Olympic Games actually cost to host in a moment. Um, but they do put 90% back in. So let's take a look at that. So here's how the IOC have contributed to support the Olympic Games. Okay. So if we look at the latest Rio 2016, they received 1.5 billion. Okay. Here's how the IOC contributed to the NOC. Rio, 540 million. Okay. And how they contributed to international federations, which go into sports within that host, host country, 540 million. Okay. So that is a lot of money, you know, when you're saying that 540 million, 1.5 billion. Okay. But is it enough? But these are, this is evidence of what the IOC have contributed to what they say they contribute to. This is how they distribute the money. They've also contributed to the athletes um, 
with sponsorships and scholarships. Okay, so sixty athletes from sixty NOCs were supported by Olympic scholarships in the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics. Um, they totaled up to around eleven million dollars. And these athletes who were involved in that scholarship went on to win 13 medals, 6 gold, 3 silver and 4 bronze. So by investing in athletes, it brings success to them, okay, and it brings that nice Olympic solidarity story about helping athletes. Um, do they help enough athletes? We, we'll debate that as we go through. So let's take a look at the cost of hosting the Olympic Games. What are the main costs? Transportation and infrastructure, okay? Building new roads or repairing roads, new subway lines, okay? Buying new buses, etc. There's a lot of cost in that. And in the red, I've put in a link because in the syllabus it said IOC demands. So I tried to find a few of these demands and I went through their charter. And one of the demands about transportation is there must be free access to public transport for all persons with an accredited Olympic pass. So you can imagine the amount of people that are going to arrive in the host city. So I remember Beijing, the amount they bought a lot of new buses. Okay, and the IOC executive also require their own private lane on the road, which will create congestion. So do you widen the road, etc. So transportation and infrastructure costs a lot of money to the host city. Accommodation, you know, I'll, another demand there. Each host city need to have approximately 41,000 rooms for all IOC stakeholders. That's one of their demands, okay? That's a lot of hotel rooms. That's not including the Olympic Village that needs to be built, etc., etc. So, again, big money to be providing this, okay? And probably the biggest facilities, you know, you need to build an Olympic stadium, you need a velodrome, you need the aquatic centre, you need the media centre, you need the Olympic village for the accommodation of the athletes. You do need to build that. These are your three biggest costs of hosting the Olympics, okay? Security. As we know, after Munich in 72, in Montreal, boom, the security costs were up at 100 million and there are even more now, okay? We need to keep the athletes safe. It's a priority. We need to understand terrorism is likely to be targeted at an event so big, okay? So we need to be prepared, and that's going to cost a lot of money hosting it. Food, okay? People might not think of this one, but food, one of the demands from the IOC there, you must provide food services 24 hours a day, including hot meals at the main dining hall. That's a lot of staff. That's a lot of food. You know, I remember the American team in 2016, it was the biggest they'd ever taken. All right, the women more outnumbered the men. They had a squad of just athletes of 500 and something. That's just America. If they were in the dining hall, that's going to fill up and that's just Team America. So there needs to be a lot of food available every hour of the day. Okay, and then the relocation of people. This is commonly linked to Beijing, who were moving people out of key areas where they needed to build and they needed to rehouse them. Okay, and um, whether that's morally right, it, it still it it came at a cost. Okay, and um, so relocating people costs money. But the main ones are your top three there. Okay. So. Here's a, a graphic here about what the Olympic Games end up costing the city itself. This wasn't the overall number of what it cost to run the Games. Some money will have come from sponsorship, but it ended up costing Sochi 21 billion, nearly 22 billion themselves. That's what it cost the city. Okay, a 289% overrun. So you can see here it costs the cities themselves a lot more than they actually think when they're bidding to host, okay? How did this all start? Well, we go back to Montreal 1976. I just mentioned this. When they bid to host the Olympic Games, they estimated it in total, including the stadium, $120 million. However, the stadium was 10 times that. 
it was 1.1 billion. And the security, like I've just mentioned, nearly covered their whole estimation, 100 million. And that was because of Munich four years old, earlier. And the building costs, contractors just wanted more money. And then there were delays. So then you've got to pay more money to get it finished on time. Okay. So were there any impact and benefit? Well, they were still paying the debt 30 years later. So no positive legacy there. Were there any successes? Well, we just go four, uh, eight years on. LA 1984, there was huge pressure not to follow in the footsteps of the North America and Montreal. So what did they do? They started raising broadcasting fees. $289 million they raised at a local level. They had an operating surplus of $215 million by the time they completed the games. Wow, $215 million left. Okay, how and why? Well, they went at it from a strategic point of view. They employed Uber off as the head of their organizing committee, the LA organizing committee. And he had this strategic plan. He privately funded the whole event. And this is where, what started the global games. And this is when the spiral started. People were getting more money from sponsors. So they started building fancier stadiums. So they were both going up. But in LA, they actually were smart about it. They refurbished or repurposed facilities they already had in the city. Whatever they had to build that was new, they found sponsorship for. Okay, that's what they did. Impact and benefits. Well, it started the globally funding of the games. The city benefited and were not let, left with debt and unused facilities. So that was a success story from a financial point of view. So I keep talking about this spiral of extravagance, okay? Why do, do costs keep going up and up? So here's the initial budget compared to final cost. And if we just focus on Sochi, you know, it ended up costing them 51 billion and 21 of that was cost on Sochi. 30 billion they might have raised, um, but 21 of it is what cost the city. So 51 billion to run that Winter Olympics. It's big money, big, big money, okay? So you can just see there, I mean, Rio have said the bid was gonna be 14, but you're still $6 billion over. Why is this happening? Well, you have this want, the want to outdo the other Olympics, you know? People who, the cities that bid to host, you know, they wanna be known as, oh, one of the best Olympics ever, you know? like we had touted with Sydney 2000, which we'll come on to um, with regards to the, the dysfunctional aspects of the doping. Sydney was one of the best ever. You had London, which was a massive success. They introduced women's boxing and loads of other key things going on. People want that. Barcelona 92, another one. They want to outdo the last Olympics. They want it to be known as the best ever. That increases costs because you start building fancy stadiums, which costs a lot of money. The people building them stadiums, they want more money for the construction. They know there's big money in the Olympics. They know you need it doing on time. The security costs, so they're going to charge you money, okay? And reduce government backing or recessions within the city, okay? More, less money is available from the government itself, which puts more pressure on finding them private sponsors, okay? So you end up getting in a lot of debt. But it's not just that, like we mentioned earlier, the broadcast revenue has spiraled. Going back to Rome, 1960, when the Paralympics started, 1.2 million in broadcasting, and then up to 2.6 billion for Rio. So that's quite a, a spiral of extravagance. Okay, like I say, the IOC have started charging them more um, because the, the, the costs for the whole cities are going up. Okay. So massive sponsorship and broadcasting rights. Now we'll move on to the athletes. I'm realizing this is getting on to be a very long video, but as always, you just pause as you go through, watch it a few times, you know, watch the first 10 minutes in one sitting, then the rest. Okay, but we'll keep going. So the athletes, what are the upsides for the athletes competing at the Olympic Games? Why, why is it good for them? 
the media attention, the broadcast rights. We know they're paying big money. They're paying big money because they want the top athletes on the screen, okay? They want to televise the success stories. That brings more public spotlight, okay? Brings more attention. You may be your casual audiences who might just tune in for the 100 meter final. They might end up watching more and then they start learning the name of other athletes. That might inspire them to, to take up the sport or they might start watching you after the olympics in the nationals the europeans etc etc big sponsorship deals okay athletes now that it's gone past the amateurism athletes are allowed to be privately sponsored so an example there usain bolt and his puma deal okay so if you can get hold of sponsorship it can be beneficial for you and you're representing your country on the most televised sports event in the world. I keep saying that throughout, but that's true. So you represent your country on the best stage, competing against the best athletes in the world, that supreme mental and physical challenge, okay? You put it all on the line and represent your country, okay? What financial support is there for athletes? Well, if you're lucky enough, you can pick up some sponsorship, whether that be commercial, um through the Olympic programs or private, okay, like Puma, Adidas, Nike, etc. Grants from the government are public. The example there is the lottery funding in the UK. We talked about that at AS level, okay. That money does go into the Olympic program as well. Or the IFs, if it goes into the IFs, the international federations, you're backing the sport. Within that sport, you have two avenues, your professional, uh, the Olympics and your amateur. So you might pick up some of that money. And bursaries, you know, Adam Peaty, world's best breaststroke, you know, he trains out of Loughborough University, you go on his Instagram, that's where he's posting from, so, you know, universities are smart, that'll uh, what attract more students to want to go there, um, and they have world-class facilities, you know, universities are a big businesses too, the amount of money they're making, so they can give access to athletes within their country to train. But there's always a downside there's so many athletes in the games that not everyone's getting hold of this money. So here's from the Huffington Post in America. And they, you know, did their research, interviewed a lot of athletes. And it was at best, athletes were saying, it's easily a six-figure investment with no guarantee of a return. I mean, the return of a gold medal, so you're proud, but the real return they're wanting is... Um, a big sponsorship so they can go through the Olympiads, go through them four-year cycles, okay? Try to live that legacy like Phelps, picking up medals and become a, a decorated Olympian, okay? They're all looking, sponsorship will allow that to happen. So what cost do athletes have in pursuing this Olympic dream? Paying for their equipment. There's a lot of specialised events. We'll come up this in a later video about... There are some known as wealth sports, equestrian money for horses, skiing, and some specialized events which cost a lot of money. Travel. And this is not just travel to the Olympics. Sometimes there is the broken time payment. This is traveling throughout that four-year cycle. I mean, in... Lin uh, in oh, sorry. In uh, England, you know, a lot train out of Nottingham or a lot go to Sheffield, the boxing hub, Anthony Joshua training there. He's a, Lon a London now. Well, he's someone who has the sponsorship, but other boxers in there, you know, they'll have to travel to Sheffield, you know, to do their training. Then you've got the coaching. You might need coaching prior to getting into the Olympic team. You might pay for coaching because you want to be an Olympic athlete and you still need to make the Olympic squad. Accommodation with the travel, you know, attending nationals, all of this, staying in hotels, etc. And loss of income. A lot of people, when they first start the dream, have jobs and they have to work less hours so they can train. Remember, the reason it went from amateurism to professionals is because it is a full-time pursuit. It's a four-year cycle. We've talked about this in periodization. Athletes need to be training to peak at the best. And if you're only training on evenings, you know, those athletes without sponsorship will be at an advantage. So some athletes take the risk. You know, some have rich parents, 
you know, they or they just have not very rich parents, but they believe in their children and they invest their life savings and and loss of income, loss of hard earned money. And like we've seen from the American study and the, the newspaper reporting, there's no guarantee of a return. So let's try to bring this video to a closing. Let's look at the pros and cons of hosting the Olympics. And I want you to just pause here. Okay. You can pause it and take notes. So positives of hosting investment. If you do start um, repairing or investing in your long-term infrastructure, it will improve transport links for the, the city in general in the future. Increase tourism more marketing okay sporting experience then world-class facilities might increase mass participation within the city once in a lifetime experience holding the olympics it, it does bring it can bring sorry a unique feeling that feel good factor where hosting the olympics it brings a lot of attention on the city you get to celebrate your culture that cultural diversity a celebration of your city and again if you have a successful games You'll be known for it, all right? The consequences of this are inefficient investment, all right? Uh, buildings, facilities that well, I've got there that are unused at the end. Do you need all of this transportation infrastructure if you don't get the tourism? Okay, during the time of the Olympics, locals will face congestion, getting to work. It's just a normal work day for them. But if you have all of this extra footfall and transportation, you're going to face congestion and um, cost the taxpayers. There is studies that suggest after the Olympics tax goes up. So the people who live there who just face this congestion and they start paying back the debt with increased taxes. Hence why public are not always supportive of the Olympics and there have been protests when they know their home city are bidding for the Olympics. And there have been cases where cities have pulled their bid because the public aren't supportive. OK, and a lot in the Rio games felt the money was misused. And you might get an unsex unsuccessful games, you know, Sochi, 51 billion it cost to host that. Montreal, you know, paying the debt back 30 years later. Let's take a look at some quick examples. England welcomed more than one visitor the year later. OK, 12 percent increase in tourism, which equated to 2.5 five seven billion dollars barcelona entered after a successful olympics they were in a travel and leisure magazine to say visit barcelona third best city in europe so that helped their profile as a city in la it brought a record 43.2 million tourists in the year after the uh, F, the um the year after so in comparison to 83 uh, the, the time of the Olympics, they had a 9.3% increase. China started negotiating with the World Trade Organization and they opened trade for the country after being awarded the Games. And as we know, China being a trade hub of the whole world, same financial reason for Tokyo. And that feel good factor. Um, one of the local residents in Pyeongchang said the entire town was dancing when they won the right to host the games. Now we have consequences. We've seen that overrun on the graphic. So the average overrun cost is 252% overrun. Greece, their financial crisis was worsened because they'd hosted the Olympics um, beforehand. They still had debt. And then once the economy collapsed, it just hurt the country more and more. Pyeongchang, while they were all out singing and dancing because they were hosting the Games, they were proud, but before the Games even began, they'd already decided they would demolish the $78 million Olympic Stadium. Beijing's Bird Nest Olympic Stadium costs the city $11 million a year just to maintain, and that huge 91,000-seat stadium just sits unused. Um. To make way for the new infrastructure in Olympics, an estimated 1.5 million people were forcibly evicted from their homes. Now, in the syllabus, it says 300,000, um, but more accurate reports um, suggest that was a lot more of that. The main point being people were forced to leave their homes while 
Beijing were developing this new infrastructure. Okay. All right, it seems like a long video. We've got one last thing. I promise probably should have split this into two in hindsight, but like I just repeated, you can pause the video. Let's look at the case study Beijing. Beijing comes up a lot. A lot of these points will be from a financial sense. Let's start with the positives. By adding a third runway, this infrastructure I'm talking about, to the airport, they tripled its capacity of inbound and outbound passengers. Okay, that's huge for travel um, in future years. They improved the roads. They added two motorway links and it reduced congestion. So actually their locals got a benefit. China is known for its traffic. The infrastructure from the games improved that positive legacy. Okay, they improved the infrastructure and it had some positives. There were five new subway lines. Okay, again, another line to the airport. So that increases tourism. If people can fly into Beijing, get straight into the city, um, it all helps. They expanded the bus system to 20,000 vehicles, which were environmentally friendly. China also known for its pollution. Um, but by having um, more eco bus systems, it helped. They built high-rise apartments and moved people from urban areas to the city. People moved from old buildings to new ones. And they used the foreign exchange reserves for funding of the games. What were the negatives? Again, what I've just mentioned, that bird, bird nest stadium, 11 million a year to maintain. And people were forcibly evicted from their homes. You know, this is why Beijing got criticised in the public spotlight uh, for human right infractions, etc. And other things going on with how products are manufactured in China and their cheap labor costs. They come under a lot of criticism in the public spotlight and that got passed on to the IOC. They are the overarching authority of this. Why have you let them bid the games? Okay, so there were positives and negatives to that. But Beijing is known for leaving a positive legacy. As you know, I've linked that video to you um, of the Qingdao and the, the impact sailing had on that city. Okay, and then this all brings problems with the bidding process. Okay, less and less countries bid to host the Olympic Games because of how much it costs. Okay, people are coming up with um, new ideas. The video I linked to you, I'm going to get it wrong now, but that region in Germany that wants to host the Olympics, they want to host it um, as a region which includes Dortmund, etc., because they have the trans potation system a bit like LA they have facilities dotted around there isn't that much needed but less and less bid to host and this is why um one like I just mentioned Beijing come under a lot of scrutiny as do a Rio Sochi you will be in the spotlight for your misdoings okay the spiral of extravagance okay you're always wanting to outdo the last Olympics the cost of overruns, how much is it actually going to cost the city itself? They're going to have to pay what they don't raise in sponsorship. Okay. The fear of unused facilities, them white elephants, just like the bird's nest, they cost money. I mean, Pyeongchang, they've built a $78 million stadium and they'd already agreed to demolish it before the games began. Uh, the public not being supportive. And no guarantee of a positive legacy. There's no guarantee you'll get mass participation. There's no guarantee you'll get more tourism. It's all just doing your best and you're trying to do it. So this is where the bidding process becomes a problem. And then we've got corruption. We'll get onto that in the dysfunctional aspect with Salt Lake City uh, about that. But these are some of the problems with the bidding process in terms of the economics. Okay. Right, we'll bring that video to a close. If you're still with me, well done. Um, there are a lot of points there. Please pause, go through. It's a revision video. Okay, rewind, fast forward, etc., etc. But I hope it helps. Thank you.